We're going with Facebook and we're going to Instagram. This is the Aesthetic Half Hour. I'm Dr. Steve Weiner from the Aesthetic Clinique. We're in the Panhandle of Florida between Destin and Panama City. Today I want to talk to you about avoiding or reducing vascular complications of fillers. Those are the dreaded complications of fillers. And if you do some simple steps that I tell you, you can keep yourself out of trouble most of the time. So what is vascular complications? Well, this right here. This is what happens when a blood vessel gets occluded with filler in the nasolabial fold and it goes unrecognized for a couple days. The key to success is treating these early within the first few hours, maybe up to four hours. Sometimes you can get away with treating them after 24 hours, but try to treat these as soon as possible. So here's another one. This is a horrible complication from nasal injections of filler. All these patients I pulled off the internet, they're not my patients. Um, in uh, Asia, injecting the nasal area is very popular, and that's why they have a lot of complications from filler, because the nose is a very vascular structure, with connections to a lot of these areas, which I'm going to talk to you about. But remarkably, even how bad this uh, event was, it, you could see, even see it affected her eye. I'm not sure if she had blindness or not, but it did affect some of her nerves of her eye because you see it's, it's pushed laterally. Um, so the lateral, um, the medial rectus was affected, as well as there's some ptosis. But take a look, she was hospitalized, placed on steroids. I'm not sure about the treatment with hyaluronidase or not, but she had a significant improvement. And you can see her eyes, they are conjugate now where they were disconjugate before. She has a lot more healing to go. She's a lot red, but, but you can get improvements with these, even with disastrous uh, looking uh, like this, going to that, that's pretty good. So here's another one I pulled from the internet. The nasolabial fold is a very common area of vascular compromise. It's, it's this uh, facial vessel that becomes the angular vessel around the nose that can get occluded. Okay, and here's another one. This is what happens early on when you have vascular occlusion. You get this reticular formation. So immediately what you're going to get is blanching, which means the area becomes pale. Then you're going to get this reticular formation where it almost looks like spider webs and it happens way away from the area that was treated. It looks like this area was treated, but look, the eye is affected. So is the marionette area. So this is typical of what happens when you have an early vascular occlusion. These are the times that you want to treat, not with the times when they're already having necrosis. So what happens? So the, obviously the face is very vascular. These are the uh, vessels that you need to know about. So here's the facial vessel, uh, facial artery, and it there, there's a branch off that comes the lateral nasal artery, and then it becomes um, the angular artery, and it comes up here. But the key to this is that it anastomoses with the internal, so this is external carotid, um, branch and then there's an internal carotid branch that's that it merges with which is called the supratrochlear artery and if a uh, embolus of the filler goes into that area it can cause blindness so you have to know your anatomy very well so the forehead the gabella the nasal labial infraorbital area periorbital area are all at risk for necrosis. So you have to know your anatomy here. Um, here's a more detailed uh, evaluation here. Here's the angular artery as I discussed. And then here it is anastomosing with the supratrochlear and supraorbital vessels. So if you insert a uh, embolus, a, a particle of filler, and you, you have a lot of pressure behind it, what it does is it will migrate and then it will go back into the central retinal artery and that becomes a disaster it becomes blindness there's very few if any cases there's maybe one or two cases that have been uh, improved from blindness due to filler so um, what are the areas uh, this is a study that uh, amassed all the areas 
where there was blindness associated with fillers. And there's approximately 100. There, it's obviously underreported, but this, this had approximately 100. They were mostly out of Asia. And you can see the area, the dots represent the areas, uh, uh, the events. So the more dots there are in an area, the more like, the more events occurred where you had blindness. So the nasal area was a very high area. So was the forehead and gabella area, but also nasal labial as well. A little bit in the temples, a little bit in the infraorbital area. So what has caused blindness in patients? Uh, the number one, almost 50%, it's due to fat, okay? The next most common, about 25%, a quarter of them, is due to hyaluronic acid. Those are your typical fillers that you use. The next most common was collagen. I don't know if anyone uses paraffin. PMMA, uh, also known as Bellafil, less than 5%. Silicone, less than 5 All these others are very low. Calcium hydroxyapatite. PLLA, which is the Sculptra, are very low. And probably uh, the reason why hyaluronic acid is very high is just because it's used uh, a much higher percentage than these other products. So what do you need to do to optimize your safety during administration of filler? You obviously have to know your anatomy and you have to know the landmarks and you have to know the structures. If you're not comfortable with a particular area as an injector, then avoid that area. The high-risk areas that I just discussed are the gabella, nose, and periocular area. If you're a new injector or you're not comfortable with a certain area, always use hyaluronic acid fillers because they are reversible. Keep in mind that uh, orbital complications are rarely reversible. This is a bit controversial, but not in my book. Always use cannulas when feasible, and I'll go into some detail about cannulas and why I prefer to use cannulas for most of my injections. Remember, I prefer the larger sizes, 23 or 25 gauge. The smaller sizes are more like a needle and behave like a needle. So cannulas appear, the, the literature is slowly coming out, they appear to be safer than needles. They have a blunt tip to them, and here's one right here, um, and you can see, I hope I, I can show you, I'm pushing it on my finger, and I'm not poking my finger. It's because the end of it is not sharp. The other thing is it's bendable. Do you see that? It's bendable. So those two key components make the cannula safer. This is a 25 gauge cannula and uh, I'm merging from 27s to 23s and 25s. This is the soft fill, but uh, Dermasculpt also makes these. So the 23 gauge cannulas have never been implicated uh, in a vascular or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in a orbital uh, complication. So why don't you guys come over here? I'm gonna try to demonstrate the differences between needles and cannulas. So, I'm taking a straw right here and I'm pretending that is a blood vessel. And what I have right here is a needle and a cannula. So when I'm trying to uh, insert filler, look what happens if I insert it over the blood vessel. It can go in. Look at, I'm in the vessel right here. And then I, then I inject a little bit and all of a sudden I have a vascular complication. Okay. So, what happens when I'm using cannulas? Okay, I can try and try and try and try, but what happens? It's bouncing away from it, okay? And that's typically what happens inside the body. It bounces off the blood vessels, okay? So I'm gonna talk about other techniques to use. So let's say you are using a needle. My recommendations are if you know where the vessel is, is that you try to be perpendicular to the vessel. It's not always possible, but you can try. Here's the reason. Okay, I'm pierced the vessel, but I'm perpendicular to it. You see that? When I start injecting, which is always retrograde, which means as I'm coming out, you're only in the vessel for a very short time. If you're parallel to the vessel, you can conceivably be inside the vessel for quite a while. 
So that's why I recommend being as perpendicular. See, now I'm injecting and it's in the vessel for quite a long time. So try to be perpendicular to the vessel. Always do retrograde. Now, is there any point in inserting it into the skin like so? I'm in, well, I'm inserting it into the skin and doing an aspiration, okay? I don't think so, okay? I think there's very, there's several factors why that's not a good one. One is, is that it's very difficult to keep that tip in the exact same spot where you're aspirating as then when you're injecting. You always are moving when you're injecting too. So I'm not sure you're exactly, you're, you're exactly in the same place that you're aspirating. Number two, a lot of times the filler is very viscous and I'm not sure that the blood will flow into the filler if you're aspirating. So th those are some factors. So a negative aspiration doesn't mean that you're not in the vessel. Again, cannulas is the way to go in my opinion. So let's go back up here. So another good technique is to avoid boluses. So small linear threads. What I mean is if, if you're injecting, don't continue to inject in the same spot. Because if you are in the same spot and you're in a vessel, you're going to get a large amount of filler within the blood vessel. So what you do is if you're there, you go boink, 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 boink. You do very small little injection points or you do linear threading, which is, which is moving it around. And, okay. So constantly moving the tip is key. Because if you're in a vessel, you're going to be out of a vessel very quickly. So the amount of filler that goes within the blood vessel is going to be very small. A negative aspiration does not equate to being extravascular and can give a false sense of security. Okay? I've already said that. When you inject on the periosteum, it doesn't mean it is safe. However, it is probably the safest place to inject. We, there's one technique that was suggested at a meeting when you're injecting in the gabella or nasal area is to put pressure on the supratrochlear vessels. So if by chance you do get filler within those vessels, it does not go retrograde into the central uh, retinal artery. So retrograde injections are safer than anterior grade. Um, Dermal injection should be relatively safe. When you're in the lips, deep injections should be avoided because the, the vessels are deep to the muscles. An injection perpendicular to the vessel is safer, as I discussed. You always have to have six to eight vials of Hyalinex on hand. And I prefer Hyalinex over Vitres because Hyalinex is a recombinant form of the hyaluronidase and there are no allergies to that as opposed to vitrase in which there are some anaphylactic allergies. So you, you're sitting there and you have a vascular problem, you go, reach for your vitrase and you inject it and now you have another problem if they're anaphylactic to it. Because so, you want to inject that very rapidly and you don't have time to do a little bit of testing in my opinion. Hyalinex is going to be a little bit more expensive. It's worth it. Get the Hyalinex. So this is for everyone. If there's unusual bruising, pain, or visual changes after a filler, you need to call your doctor, regardless of what time. And the staff that answers the phone have to understand that there is regular bruising and then there's unusual bruising. I showed you what unusual bruising is. If there is pain after having injections, that's a red flag. It shouldn't happen. You should have minimal discomfort after these. So I tried to do it very quickly uh, and succinctly as to what to look for, what, what happens with vascular occlusion and how, and how to treat it. Uh, I didn't actually tell you how to treat it, but I can go into that. So what do you do if you suspect a vascular occlusion? What you do is you massage, you apply heat, you give them an aspirin, the controversial parts are whether you give nitro paste and or Viagra because that dilates the vessels. It's possible that the embolus uh, filler could go further down the chain. So 
That's not the big, big uh, point. The biggest point is, is you flood the area with Hylinex and you do two, three, four vials of Hylinex, which is 150 milligrams. So you get around 450 to 600 and then you repeat it in uh, 15 to 30 minutes if you're not getting a response. Um, what else can I tell you? So uh, massage is key, heat is key, and um, also have a relationship with your ophthalmologist just in case there's a vascular problem. You should all look up how to do retrobulbar injections with hyaluronidase. Uh, hopefully you'll never have to do that, but it seems to be, I haven't had to do it, but it seems to be a fairly straightforward procedure. You go with a cannula along the orbital floor uh, with, uh, and you inject, uh, again, a lot of Hylinex in that retroorbital area, and you can do it superiorly as well. You go behind the globe. So anyways, um, this is my Instagram account right here. Here's my phone number, and if you uh, need to get a hold of me, um, you can DM me through this or through my phone number. Thanks very much. There's one more here. Okay. If you want to shadow me, I'm the number one physician trainer for Galderma for fillers. Um, I, I can teach you about blunt cannulas, my rejuvenation, as well as using lasers. So give us a call as well. Thank you, Dr. Steve Wine.